Sometimes it takes a different approach to help you unlock your true potential. Capella University's game-changing FlexPath format helps you learn at your own pace and fit earning a degree into your life. From before you enroll to after you graduate, you'll be supported by people who are invested in your success so you can pursue your goals knowing that help is available if you need it. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. Stop punishing yourself with bland, chalky protein shakes and fuel your fitness with the best protein in the game at GNC. We've got the hottest brands and flavors that legit taste like cookies, your favorite cereal, indulgent desserts, and more. It's on at GNC. Oh my gosh, I can't believe the story Jackie just told about Jeffrey Epstein and Trump and Clinton and everything. But first, Jackie, the joke man, Martling, wrote for many years, 15 years for Howard Stern, wrote for Rodney Dangerfield, is an awesome stand-up comedian. He's just an all-around good guy. I remember the last time Jackie was on the podcast was years ago, and we were talking about what is a dirty joke? And he sent me these two huge books. They were like academic books about the history of the dirty joke. And like, that's the kind of just generous, good guy Jackie is. He just sent these books and they're fascinating. You know, Jackie and I got together today. We talked about his his history and, and what's going on and the documentary about the joke man. So, so it's his whole story. It's really interesting. And his whole career is interesting, but... Towards the end, I got him to, he, he didn't really hold back, but I got him to tell this story of his experience with Jeffrey Epstein. And he's innocent of any, anything. Don't make any assumptions there. But it was just a fascinating story. So here he is, Jackie, the joke man, Martling. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. All right, now we're rolling. Yeah. Now we're rolling. And Jackie, it's it it's been a minute since we spoke, since probably before COVID, I think, right? Yeah, I told Jay, I figured you guys lost my phone number or my email address or something. No I way. Thought we were pals, you know. And <laughs> I I probably talk about you at least once a week or so. Like you have so many interesting stories and such an interesting background, and I, I've learned a lot from you. I I just heard that some. A friend of mine who was on the gymnastic team with me 40 or 50 years ago got my number and called me. He said, Jack, I heard James Altich you're talking about you on his show. And he's like in San Diego. I haven't seen him in 40 years. So the way I connect so, you is through a guy from 40 years ago. So do so that, that there's, man. There's several things that are hilarious about that. One is you were on the gymnastics team. And I see in the documentary, you're doing flips. You're like an Olympic level, or you were like an Olympic level gymnast. I did not know this. You know, James, that's very funny. Because I'm sure as you're aware, uh, if you know a little bit more than somebody, you seem very, very smart. You know what I mean? I mean, I was, I was okay. I was by no means great. I was third in Nassau County here on Long Island in 1965. But in those days, there were no there were no gymnastic teams. We didn't start with gymnastics as kids. When I joined the gymnastic team in ninth grade, it was the first one in the area, and it was like six of us. I got good enough to be third in the county, but the guy that was first was so good. The guy that was second was so far below him, and I was third, and I was so far below him. But compared to the average person, they see you doing a flip. They're like, wow, that guy should be in the Olympics, you know. But the, the, the one crazy thing about it is people go nuts because they see us doing it on the hardwood floor, on the hard gymnasium wooden floor. You know, we, this, we were doing it long before they had those mats, you know. It was a trial, you know. It was great. It was great. Well, it's because you did, I mean, ninth grade, you're 15 years old. You didn't. You didn't start till you were old. Like a lot of like professional gymnasts now, they start when they're three years old. So how did, how did you get so good? 
I guess I, you know, I did tumbling and stuff in seventh and eighth grade. And then in high school, in ninth grade, uh, we started doing it. And by 11th grade, 1965, I was a little better. You know, we, we really worked hard at, it. you know, two or three nights a week and weekends. And, uh, and it was just such a bonding thing. There was only six or eight of us. We used to go to the gymnastic meets in the coach's car. Can you imagine the, the, the that sounds legal suspicious. ramifications? It's ridiculous. It sounds impossible. And if we did good, he'd take us to, you know, McD- it wasn't even McDonald's yet. It's like Burger Square, you know, just fun, just really fun. I'm still friends with all those guys, you know, it's just fantastic. But the second thing that's funny about it is you haven't spoken to this guy in 40 years. Didn't he call you and say, Jackie, I just heard you on Howard Stern or Jackie, I just heard you with Rodney Dangerfield. It was, it took me for him to call you. No, th- yeah, that's what triggered him. I mean, I'm sure. He wasn't surprised to hear me on Howard Stern or any of that stuff because it kind of fell in. But being with you is kind of, you know, I have such odd connections. If you saw the documentary, you know that, uh, you know, I I hook up with weird people for weird, but they're always great reasons. I hook up with interesting people. I got a guy I need to talk to you about. And you might say, well, he's my best friend or you might not know who he was, who he is. But I got interviewed last week by Bran Ferrin. Do you know who that is? No, I don't know him. He was the head of research and development for Imagineering at Walt Disney, like in the 90s. And he's like 72. And he is one of those guys that I would put on a level with you as far as brilliance and oh. success. And like, I mean, I'll send you, I'll send you his, his Wikipedia looks like a college course. And he was so, just like you, he's so nice and so unassuming. You don't, you don't realize, you know, the power this guy has. And he's making an, a documentary with the people from all walks of life. And I guess I was walking by. It's something like that, you know. Well, you know, you have, you have such an interesting, interesting story. But I do want to mention, you know, it says in the documentary, you're like the hardest working guy in comedy. And it's true because I'll just say right here while we're recording this, it's President's Day. We didn't wimp out and say, oh, no, we need a little break. We need a holiday. We got to think about the president all day. We're here at work on a podcast talking talking your story. Of course. I figured we should do it quick before they take down the statues of Washington and Lincoln. You know, the, the, the world is going to crap, James. I figured we should get in the interview as soon as we can. You know, the world, world could end tomorrow the way things are going. So. Well, and I'm thrilled that, you know, I'm th- I don't, you know, there's no holidays. If you're a comedian, you're in show business, you know, you know, you worked on holidays, you worked on weekends, you know, so there is no, you know, you stop when you can stop and you go when you can go. It's that simple. You know, I didn't even look when you said Monday, whatever today is February 19th. I, I said, go, yeah, I just looked, my calendar was blank, you know, so boom, of course, you know. Yeah. And, you know, in, in the, um, in the documentary also, it says you, you make regular trips to the post office, which is by itself is uh, an odd thing now nowadays, and that you're, you're so good at networking. And I just, I think the reason this guy called you is because I was on a call with several thousand people who subscribe to uh, this newsletter I write, and I wanted to show people what you once mailed to me. Hold on, I'm going to get it right now. I, I just realized I had it right here. I'm going to guess a joke book. No, this it's a very almost academic book by, by G Legman rationale of the dirty joke. I sent them to so few people like that is an indication of my respect for you. Cause those things are so rare, James. It's, it, I mean, look, it's, it's an analysis of sexual humor. And I just opened to a random page here, the edible infrastructure of the defiance of authority merely because it is authority, i.e. patria potestis, restraining one from sexual enjoyment of the mother or mother. Like, this is the weirdest academic book I've ever seen. This guy, did you see the movie The Aristocrats? Yeah, yeah, great. Well, you guys, they show this book. Uh, oh, I don't they remember show my, that. my two copies. Of this This was part of a two-book series, okay? Yeah, I have that the this, other book here as well. The, ra- the Rationale of the Dirty Joke is the other yeah. one. He was drummed out of the University of Pennsylvania because they didn't think collecting dirty jokes and dirty rhymes 
was a viable form of of scholastics, which is ridiculous because it's it's what makes the word you know it's word of mouth and it's 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 our lives. So he got drummed out and he wound up in uh, the south of France. And I, you know how voracious I am for jokes. I'm not a comedian. I love jokes and I've collected them forever and ever and ever. And at one point, you know, these stupid things in the back of comic books, uh, 12 records for a penny or yeah. 12 books for 99 cents. So you look through and there's never anything you want. And all of a sudden I saw rationale of the dirty joke. I was like, you got to be kidding me. So I put in my 99 cents and got whatever other books with it. And I got this thing. Obviously, it, it's, you know, overstocked that they have. And they can't get rid of these things because nobody would buy that stupid thing. And I got this book and I was just so fascinated. And the, and the foreword was about 20 pages. And at the end, it had Gershon Legman, Valbon, France, and the Country Code. And me being me, you know what a nut I am. I took everything I had and wrote to the guy and said, listen, this thing says there's a part one to this uh, two-volume set. This, this is 1977. There's no internet, no nothing. Right. I said, I, I, I got to get one. And he, two weeks later, the guy wrote back from the south of France and said, I have two copies. I don't need two copies. Send me $18 and I'll sell you one. And then we wound up being good friends until he died. And then I got rich. Well, not rich compared to but I mean, I got to where I was very comfortable. And he's alone with his wife in the south of France. And they're living like, you know, on beans. So I'd send him a couple hundred dollars so him and his wife could go out for a nice dinner and get wine. And we were pals. And those books, the amazing thing, the guy goes on and on and, uh, you know, he's so pedantic. It's crazy. But if you looked at the book, he's kind enough to put the jokes themselves in italics. So you can go through the book and not read all his craziness and all his, you know, descriptions of where he got the jokes and blah, blah, blah. And you can just read the jokes by just reading the italics. And of course, I knew 90 percent of the jokes in there. But man, did that make me fall in love with the 10 percent I'd never seen. And uh, and he's just a wacko. So the craziness of this is I heard the joke, The Aristocrats, in about 1979, 1980. I was working in the Fort Lauderdale comic strip. And this British comedian told that joke to me and a couple guys, and it blew me away. So it became my favorite joke. This guy, Gershon Legman, his premise, his life's premise is that you are totally defined by what you think is funny, okay? So these books are so big and thick, it's like the Bible. You can only read a few pages at night. I have read the Bible, but you know, it's so thick that you can't sit down and go, you gotta read chunks of it at a time, yes. open it at random. So at some point, like I people do, at the end of the second book, I started from the end and went back. And the last joke on the last page of the second volume was the aristocrats. Not only that, he said, this next joke was told to me by a guy who was raised in squalor with two parents that battled for 40 years but stayed together for the good of the children. I said, holy Christ, this guy just described my life and this is my favorite joke. I said, that I just rubber stamped his premise. So then when I came out with a joke book in 1998, as an homage to him, I made the aristocrats the last joke on the last page of my joke book. So 10 years later, Penn Gillette and Paul Provenza come to my apartment in the city and said, Martin, we're doing a, a, a movie about the joke, the aristocrats, and we got to put you in the, in the movie because we did a search on the web of the aristocrats and we only got two hits and they were both your website. Oh, that's funny. Because on my website, I had Gershon Legman's version and my version. And it was, you know, it was such a, an odd thing that until that movie, nobody, you know, comedians don't tell each other that many jokes. There's certain, like I do, and there's some comedians that tell jokes, but a lot of them don't, you know. So that was a little bit, a little bit of horse crap. But uh, by the way, that's, the, the, that, 
one of the best renditions of the aristocrats that I've ever heard was your 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 buddy, may he rest in peace, Gilbert Gottfried's uh, rendition of it was was brilliant. I will tell you that I told him that joke, and the, I don't care what people believe or not. The version he tell told of the joke on on that night, the Hugh Hefner roast, was almost exactly the way I told it to him. Because you can go on with a joke. If you go on and on and on too much, if you want to make a shaggy dog story, that's one thing. But at some point, you got to give a certain amount of information and then you got to get to the end. The people go out to lunch. So I'm not a fan of this, you know, making it so disgusting and so crazy, blah, 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 blah. Unless you're just doing it for the field day of it, like Larry the Boil Sucker or one of those jokes, you know. But that was, that was, I was sitting on the dais that night and that was one of the classic things when all the comedians realized what he what he was about to go into, it was just spectacular, and I, he he was great fun, man. Yeah, no, he he was on my podcast once, and everything. I mean, Gilbert Gottfried was. I mean, he was like a comedian for sixty or seventy years. He was his his. I don't know whether it was his imagination and also partly his memory. Even as he was kind of on the decline, he could tell the most amazing intricate jokes and perform them i mean it's really a comedian's comedian like you are as well yeah well, me and i did gilbert's podcast like three or four times and we would just sit there and roar for an hour and it's great because frank Santo padre his partner replayed a bunch from this it's i i turned 76 on valentine's day and they replayed a bunch of uh my appearances on gilbert you know to to say happy birthday to me. And it was, and it was just so, making him howl with a joke. We were the two best audiences because I okay. laughed so hard and he laughed so hard and the dirtier it gets, the harder we laugh. You know, one time I told him a joke at a film festival and he fell in the mud. I said, this is, I, they can kill me now. This is the highlight of my joke telling career is Gilbert fell in the mud. <laughs> well, let, let me ask you a question because you tell jokes and you refine them and you perfect them you take old jokes and you you rewrite them to perfection and a lot of comedians do something very different which is they tell like even take someone like a classic comedian like like seinfeld he tells stories from his life or you think they're from his life it's a, it, it's as if they interpret the things they see in funny ways that's not what you do at all and what what do you see as the difference it's it's apples and it's so different. I always tell people I'm not a comedian. I'm a joke teller. There, you know, and there's some people look down their nose at it. But you know, when these comedians have these big conventions or whatever, when they get together at the bar, they're not sitting there telling you about uh, my girlfriend and my apartment. They're telling dick jokes. That's what that's what makes the world go round. That's what makes people laugh. That is the communication. The, the best form of communication, whether it's a dirty joke or a silly joke or meeting a girl in the bar or getting to know your father-in-law, it's just a necessary thing. And I, people say, well, you didn't write those jokes. I say, listen, when you go to a play, if you sit in the audience and they're doing Hamlet, you don't stand up and say, wait a minute, you didn't write this. They didn't write it. It's a performance. You're there to see a performance. And if they do right, it really it's well, it's really enjoyable. Yeah. And that's what I do. You know, what the, lo the thing I love, people come up and say, you know, I laugh at every joke. And half, half the time, you're almost done with the joke. And I realized I've heard it before. I'm already laughing. It's too late. <laughs> you know, I'm already laughing. That, what, that, that, what a great compliment, right? I mean, Louis C.K. did an, an episode on this in his show, Louis, where Jim Florentine's playing this other comedian and they're on tour. Jim Florentine's constantly telling fart jokes. And everyone's laughing, and Louis C.K. can't get anyone to laugh. This is this is in the episode. He can't get because he's telling like about his apartment and his girlfriend, and 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 he kind of is crying, literally crying later. He's talking to Jim Florentine and saying like, I I went into comedy to to say something to be to be meaningful, and Jim Florentine basically says, but people just like fart jokes, and they both start <laughs> laughing and cracking up because Louis C.K. realizes he's right. And and Jim Florentine in that episode literally dies on sitting on the toilet, and that's the end of the episode. So, I, I never watched that, but I never watched Louis. It's funny I worked with Louis forty years ago, um, back when Caroline's was actually on the seaport. That's so long ago. Oh, I didn't know but that. But it's it's different. 
it's different animals. You know, when I first started uh, doing comedy, you know, I gave up as a musician and I never had any intention of being a comedian, but I always told dirty jokes and I told them in my bands. And when my band broke up, I had all these millions of jokes. I figured, well, I'm going to tell these on stage because people love them. And I started doing it and then I made an album and, you know, and it just steamrolled. And in the beginning, <clears throat> people, especially like the comics from the city, oh, that's that guy from Long Island that gets up on stage and tells jokes. They think I'm going to the bookstore and buying a joke book and then finding a joke and going on stage. Meanwhile, these things are ingrained in me for the last 30 or 40 years. And I've honed them down to where I know what works to, to, to a fault, you know. And But then slowly but surely, I'd wind up working with these guys. And they'd say, wait a minute, this guy's the funniest guy we have met. You know, maybe he's not so bad. You know, and it's so funny. The funniest thing is I spent 18 years, but for 15 years, I was the head writer of the Stern Show. And I passed him notes. For 15 years to make him funnier. I never, ever handed him a joke. Everything was a comment or a sentence or an aside. It's like if you were talking to Jay and I'm sitting at the table and we're having a conversation, I'm a funny guy. If I think of something funny to say at lunch, instead of saying it out loud, I write it down and put it in front of James. And James says it. So you get to be as funny as you and as funny as me. And I'm just sitting there laughing. And people say, well, who's that idiot? I'm, well, that's the idiot that's making Howard Stern a gazillion dollars. That's who I am. Yes, it's totally true. Airbnb has changed my life. If anything, they have made my life so much better. Like I used to live in Airbnbs. I, I lived in over a hundred or 200 different Airbnbs over a three-year period. And I loved it. I love, I became a really good guest of Airbnbs and I got to know lots of hosts. So when I initially owned a house, I, of course, the first thing I thought was I'm going to turn my house into an Airbnb because I travel a lot. So why leave my house unused when I can make a side income by letting others Airbnb my house or come to stay in my house as guests and having my own Airbnb or, or being a host for Airbnb has allowed me to do just that. And I've met other hosts. I've actually spoken at Airbnb's host conference. I think it was in 2017. I met so many just nice hosts. It's a great community. And I love you know, turning my own home into an Airbnb. Like I'm traveling to Austin next month. My home's going to be an Airbnb while I'm away and I'll stay in an Airbnb. I'd rather stay in like a three-story house Airbnb than in one tiny hotel room in, in the middle of Austin during South by Southwest. So listen, while you're away, your home could be an Airbnb. Many people host on Airbnb, but there are people who are just letting their house sit empty, who've never thought about it or didn't realize their space could be an Airbnb. Hosting can easily fit into your lifestyle and is a great way to earn some extra money. So if you have a home, but you're not always at home, then you have an Airbnb. Your home might be worth more than you think. Find out how much at airbnb.com slash host. Daylight savings time is starting up again. Okay, podcast is over. That's all you needed to know. But why do we have uh, daylight savings time? Answer, to give us more daylight from March through November. By setting your clocks forward, it may feel like there are more hours in the day that initial, when we initially start daylight savings. But if you're hiring, it doesn't necessarily help you find qualified candidates for your roles any sooner. There's only one way to do that, ZipRecruiter. And right now you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash James. ZipRecruiter works around the clock to find qualified candidates for you. Once you post your job on ZipRecruiter, they send it to 100 plus job sites so you reach more of the right people. This is such a brilliant idea for a business and ZipRecruiter did it. So ZipRecruiter's smart technology also quickly scans thousands of resumes to identify people whose skills and experience match your job. I've used ZipRecruiter particularly as a potential employee and I still to this day get messages every day 
James Altucher, would you like to apply to be VP of en- entertainment at NBC or whatever? So there's just nonstop emails. Like I got five or six emails today because of, because a year ago I signed up for ZipRecruiter. So spring forward with a new hiring partner, ZipRecruiter, and find top talent sooner. See why four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. Just go to this exclusive web address to try ZipRecruiter for free. ZipRecruiter.com slash James. Once again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash James. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. It's very telling that Howard Stern picked you to do this rather than quote unquote, a comedian. Like I, do you think you were like pattern matching against jokes that you knew? And so you knew thousands and thousands of jokes So something would come up and it would trigger some memory and you would play with it and then, and then write something. Well, you know, it's, it's, there was not that much thought. It's just, if you're a funny person, you know, you, you just say wise ass things or smart things or quick twists or, where you go into a different place, and that's always who I was, and I'm sure that's why I like jokes, because the, you know everything is a little quick twist. But we were moving so fast, there was no thought to well, well, how does that parallel some joke I know? It's like, what would I say here? And I write it down, and he would say it, and and he's so brilliant that it was it was absolutely flawless. It was seamless. Nobody nobody had any idea. There's still people that don't believe I was writing jokes. Yeah, right. You were writing jokes for Howard Stern, right? I'm like, yeah, as a matter of fact, I was. <laughs> you know, it's fun. it's funny. You know, it's kind it, of flattering. It, it's totally flattering. Like, I mean, he could have. There was a million comedians out there, and you're the one he kind of picked to make him as funny as possible. And no, he did. He did not pick me. He had no intention. He was not looking for somebody to make him funnier. If you know disc jockeys. It's so egotistical. They, you, think, you think I need help? Look what, you know, when he, a disc jockey is a funny animal. And I learned that this so quick. Every disc jockey all over the country, everybody they see makes them think they're the funniest person in the world because every person a disc jockey meets is somebody he can help. When he meets a guy that owns a car business, and the car guy is standing there talking to him, and the disc jockey says something, the car guy's gonna laugh because he's gonna be, he wants to be his friend because he can help his business. And so they think they're the funniest guys in the world. And what was great is the very, very beginnings of comedy, they would send out three comedians, two or three comedians to the different cities. This is way in the beginning, early 80s. And you go to like Richmond, Virginia or Nashville and there'll be three comics. And then at some point somebody said, you know what? Why don't we get a disc jockey from the local station and let them host the show? And then we just need two comedians and the disc jockey can be the MC. And then they'll talk about it on the radio, which makes so much sense, of course. And I, James, I can't tell you how many times I watched one of these disc jockeys get up there. The whole lives they've been curtailed. They can't use foul language in the air, and they also think they are so funny. And they just cannot wait to get on that stage and say fuck and be funny. And I watched some of these guys get up there and say fuck, 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 and nobody would laugh at anything they said. They became the biggest fans of stand-up comedians because all of a sudden they got a mouthful of how difficult it is. And it was so amazing. Now, when Howard Stern... I had three albums out that I had self-produced, me and my future ex-wife. I produced two, and then she helped with a third one. And I sent these, like I sent you the Gershon Legman book. I sent albums to everybody. If I ran into you on the street and you said, hey, I saw you the other night at a comedy club, oh, let me send you my albums. Thinking, who knows who can help right. me? And I, you know, it's the way I've operated. That's why the post office, I, I go to the post office twice a day sending stuff to people. But- for no reason. Barry okay? Levine, the, the mailman at the post office in your, in your documentary. La- Larry, Larry, Larry yeah. Levine. Larry Levine. He's, he's the greatest. So, so I'm sending these albums. Me and my, me and Nancy are sending these 
sets of three albums, which this is 19, 1982. So the cost of the three albums and the postage and the cassettes, the matching cassettes to the three albums, we sent these packages, I swear to God, to hundreds of people with no idea what was going to possibly happen. We just figured something's going to come back somewhere. That's just, we're making money booking governors and we're just turning off. We're putting the money back in and drinking and having a wonderful time. So Howard Stern came to New York City. Uh, a, a club owner in Washington, D.C. said, hey, you know, this guy just got fired and he's going to New York City and he's a madman. He did broadcast in his underwear from Garvin's here. And I know you guys have hit it off. I had no idea. I never listened to the radio. I didn't know. So when I got home, I just told Nancy and we sent one of the packages of three albums to Howard Stern, Care WNBC, Rockefeller Plaza. And a couple months later, I'm in my mother's attic. My office, Jokeland, was my mother's attic with the dial joke machines. I was a madman. And she called and said, hey, this guy Howard Stern wants you to come in. So I called the NBC and Howard got right on the phone and said, oh, we listen to your records. We think you're so funny. Why don't you come in and hang out on the air today? What are you going to say? You know, I'm hosting shows at Governor's on in Levittown on Long Island, and he's asking me to come to Manhattan. Are you kidding? I would have walked. So I got there, and we broke balls for four hours, and at the end of the show, he said, you know what? You're a lot of fun. Why don't you come back next week? And I came back once a week for three years for free. And over the course of time, I was writing little ideas and passing them, and I come in with insults and then we started doing Mrs. Flemstein, playing Stump the Comedian. And it was really funny because uh, I, my stories go too long. But uh, No, no, but keep going. Mrs. Flemstein, there was a comedian. We used to work on, on the Fort Lauderdale comic strip. And Sunday nights uh, was Boys Night Out. It was like the manager didn't come in on Sunday nights. So it was like having a substitute teacher. We would break chop. We'd do whatever we wanted. And there was this very funny comedian, still funny comedian, Kelly Rogers. And he did a character. Instead of doing his act, he did a character called Shecky Flemstein, which I thought was the funniest made-up name I ever heard for a Jewish comedian, Shecky Flemstein. <laughs> so then I come on, and after a couple of weeks, Howard says, you know, I need a piece of business for you. And I said, well, you know, people send up, you know, the people yell out subjects, and I give them a joke on any subject, and it's fun. I do it at my shows. He said, well, we'll make it. Two lines. We'll call it stunt comedian, and they people can do two line jokes. But of course, the audiences. You took phone calls. Every joke was too racist, too dirty, too ethnic. You know, it was the worst crap. So we decided what we'll do is I'll come in and give jokes to Fred that are as dirty as you can get, but get away with. And Fred went in the other room and called in. In this, you couldn't figure out if it was a woman or a man. It was like an old. An old Jewish person. Hello, yeah. Howard. How you doing, yeah. Howard? And it was so funny. And after a couple of weeks, I just inserted like, oh, it's Mrs. Flemstein again. Oh, it's Mrs. Flemstein again. So at some point, weeks later, Robin goes, oh, where did we get the name Mrs. Flemstein? And I said, well, that, yeah, I named her that. And she's like, oh, right. Oh, like you named Mrs. Flemstein. So I'm not getting credit from the Stern Show. Well, I got Kelly Rogers all pissed off at me because I stole his name. So I'm getting crap from both sides, which is so funny. But so we going on and on and on, and I'm slowly passing him notes. And then he got fired. Then he got rehired at K-Rock, and I was still on one day a week. But they actually had a place for me to sit right, right in front of him where I could reach his. It, he'd have a loose leaf on either side. On one side of the loose leaf, I could put a piece of paper, an eight, 8 by 11 piece of white paper, and I write in a Sharpie. I started putting stuff up once a week. And then after a couple months, he called me. I was on the road and he said, listen, James, this was the total job description of my total job description on the Howard Stern show from that day until the day I left. The total discussion was I need a price for you to come in two days a week and do your thing with the notes. That was my total That's job description. description. 
to do your thing with the notes. And then I was on two days and then I went to three to four to five days because if you A beat it, he was so much funnier on the days I was there. Not because I'm especially funny, but because he had two senses of humor. And by me being there, now Fred had a conduit, so Fred could pass me ideas. So Howard had his sense of humor and my sense of humor and Fred's sense of humor, which is not only three guys, but three distinct, distinctly different sense of humor. And the show just got funnier and funnier and funnier and, and just went to the moon. But he was never looking for a comedian or looking for a writer. I created created that flying gag writing. You know, it's it's like the old days with Bob Hope and Bing Crosby, and they'd take a commercial break on the radio, and the writers would be scrambling things for them to say. It, you know, things don't change all that much. Only we're doing it on the fly, which was unheard of. You know, it well, was on people, you know. You know, I hope I hope people realize that what you just described is literally the formula for success. Like you accumulated a lot of knowledge about something you loved, and then you just hustled. Like you said, you'd run into someone in the street, you'd give them your albums, you would write to Gershon Legman to learn about the rationale of the dirty joke. You you wrote jokes for free and submitted them to Ronnie Dangerfield until he called you back. You did this. You you're waking up at four thirty in the morning for years for free to hang out with Howard Stern. Like this. There's no shortcuts to this. This is how you succeed. And this is also how you find value in your life. I'm, I'm sorry I'm being serious. Like, you, you know, we're... we're no, I, got, I do have to correct you. The, the, the time I was working for free was only one day a week. And that's when he was on at four, at four o'clock in the afternoon. So I wasn't right. getting up at I, 4.30 for free, but it was still a <laughs> okay, healthy still. ride to New York City. And it was costing me for a free. fortune to park. Yeah, for free. You and know, then, and I was I was trying to ingratiate myself into the works, which I did. You know, I think people I, I and I hate to kind of make I feel everyone says this about every generation and it's just not true. But people in general have a sense of entitlement. They think that if they're mildly good at something, the world owes them. But and this is not generation specific. Every generation people say is about, it's true about the, the next generation. It's about everybody. And and you demonstrated how it really works, how you really rise to the top. And that's, that's very important. I hope people listen to it. That's true for everybody I talk to. What I said in my autobiography is, you know, the old classic, if you throw enough shit against the wall, some of it's going to stick. And my shit stuck to Howard Stern. <laughs> it stuck to a lot of people. I mean, you would have, no matter, you would have ended up doing something somewhere and we'd still be having this podcast no matter what. It wasn't Howard Stern, Jackie. It, it was you. By the way, like, you know, when you were doing five days a week and you were waking up at 4.30 in the morning, uh, on the documentary, your, your now ex-wife, Nancy, she says nice things about you and, and she says how it took a toll on you and, and, of course, your marriage with her. She's so nice and gracious to you. You keep, you know, I know she's your, your ex-wife, but, you know, didn't fall apart because of the show and because of your work on the show? You know, we, it, we, we, we got in 20 years. You know, we worked so hard, uh, so close for so long. But, you know, she's incredibly, you know, I mean, we're so close. Like uh, Friday night, she made my favorite meal, Chicken Kiev. Her and her boyfriend made Chicken Kiev for me and my girlfriend, Barbara, and my sister, Katie, and her husband, Kevin. I mean, Nancy made, you know, made my birthday dinner on a Friday night. I mean, that, that with because we were such good friends before we worked together and then became lovers and then became married. You know, we had such such a long history and she's great. But part of the pressure was she's a great singer and a great actress and she's so talented and she had so much to do with all my success because, you know, I always tell people, people say, well, the reason I helped Howard so much is he's driving the bus. So he couldn't read the map. So he's driving the bus and I'm reading the map so I could do the busy work and tell him turn left, you know. And she was doing all the all the busy work. So all I had to do was be funny. I put together the jokes and recorded the jokes and edited the jokes, but she put together the deals for the CDs and they get them printed. And when we got divorced, people, oh, Nancy took half your money. I said, that's, that's a lot of crap. She took the half that she earned. And I've always defended defended her. Because there's no defending. I mean, she, you know, 
some wives, you know, hook up to a guy and they get half his money without ever doing anything. But uh, but she she was really great. But it, she's a great actress and singer. And it just nothing was happening for her. So, you know, you know, show business lightning strikes this yeah, guy and it doesn't strike this guy. So I'm coming home and the next thing you know, we're on television and we got a he's got a book deal or we got a a pay-per-view and we got a movie and, you know, we're off to Los Angeles and we're off to New Orleans. And it just, it just was hard. It was just hard that it was all happening for me. And, uh, but we, I, I used to say, listen, we are so lucky that it's happening for one of us, but that's easy for me to say. Cause I was the guy that was the one of us, you know? So that had something to do with it. And plus, you know, the pressures of, you know, it, and there's a whole long story that I don't go into about uh, us trying to have children and not succeeding. And that was uh, that was probably what really broke us. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, six six uh, trips, six cycles of in vitro fertilization, all unsuccessful. And, and that, uh, and this is back in the early '90s. There, there was no such thing as chat rooms and people commiserating with each other and everything. So it was really, really tough. So, but we all, we always stayed friends. You know, we split, I got the house on the water and she got the other three houses. So she lived two houses away for the last 25 years, you know. It's, and uh, Barbara, your, your new girlfriend, she's, they've all get along, like she's okay with everything? Absolutely. She likes Nancy more than she likes me. You know, <laughs> it's, uh, and she's great. She's terrific. I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Hey, listen, men's health is important. Men act all cocky and like they don't need anything. But the reality is, as you get older, there's some things you need. And it often feels like we're too busy to take care of our health problems. Like, I'd rather do anything than go to the doctor or the dentist or the pharmacy or whatever. But now you don't have to waste your time if you use HIMS. HIMS, H I M S, HIMS is changing men's health care by providing simple and convenient access to science backed treatments for erectile dysfunction hair loss, weight loss, and more. The entire process is 100% online, so you get a new routine of improving your overall health faster. Jay, you listening to all this? Yes, I'm definitely going to use him from now Not on. that you need it. You're, you're young and healthy. James, I'm 35. You, you're getting there. You might, you might need it. Who knows? But if prescribed, your medication ships directly to you for free and indiscreet packaging. No insurance is needed. You can manage your plan on the HIMSS app, track progress, and learn more about your conditions and how to treat them from leading medical experts. Start your free online visit today at hymns.com slash James. Could you imagine that there's a whole section just with my name on it? Hymns.com slash James. That's how I 
how much I am representative of the kind of person who needs hymns. That's H-I-M-S dot com slash James for your personalized treatment options. Hymns dot com slash James. Prescriptions require an online consultation with a healthcare provider who will determine if appropriate. Restrictions apply. See hymns.com slash James for details and important safety information. Subscription required. Price varies based on product and subscription plan. So, so Jackie, a while back, you told me this insane story that I'm hoping you'll, you'll repeat here about Jeffrey Epstein. You don't have to tell if you don't want. But no, please, was, please, please, please. Uh, yeah, I know, I know you've never held back, so I, I knew this wouldn't be a hard question, but it was an insane I didn't, story. I didn't know we hadn't, I didn't know, well, maybe I didn't tell this on the air <clears throat> to you, but, but I, I, you know, I have no problem with it, especially I, I don't know where you stand, but I, I, it's irrational how much I hate Trump. I mean, but I disliked him from the days he came on this show in the late 80s, because he'd come on the show and he was the only guy in the room. He didn't. He hardly knew Howard was in the room. And I'm like, me and Fred were looking at each other like, what kind of a dick is this guy? You know, and it turned out, you know, that's what he was. So what happened was, you know, 40 years and 50, however many years I've been doing stand up, you accumulate so many great friends and work so many different places. And I forget where we actually worked together. I know Bobby Slayton was on my radio show a couple of times when he was in New York. But for whatever reason, uh, we always went to eat after the radio show at the Palm or at the Carnegie Deli. And he said, Jackie, I, you know, you know this guy. If you ever heard the commercial on radio for Skechers, he's a guy who has this voice for, for Skechers, Skechers shoes or sneakers or something. He's just a, a great, great character from a long time ago, a, a, a California comedian. He said, oh, this, this, I'm not going to do his voice. But he said, this, this great guy, he said, he's from Florida and he's so rich. He's got all kinds of properties in Manhattan and he loves comedians. And he has like, <clears throat> has dinners and he brings us over. Like I've had dinner at his house with, with uh, Louis Black and David Brenner. And what, what year was this? This had to be like 2012 or 13. Maybe even a little earlier, because I, I harassed Slayton for a long time to try. Like every time I ever saw him, get me invited to one of those dinners. I want to go to one of those dinners. I want to. And he said, "Yeah." And the guy had apartments. So sometimes, if I was coming to New York City, he'd give me a place to stay, you know. And uh, and I knew, and Slayton knew that he had gotten the guy had gotten in trouble in Florida. Uh, but you. No, I, yeah, I don't ask a lot of questions. He was in trouble for fooling around with underage girls or whatever. But I worked in Florida a million times, and these girls would come into the Florida comic strip, and they'd look 25. And meanwhile, they're 16 years old, and you got to be careful. They're all made up and beautiful. You know, so, not that I was chasing them, but I, I could understand how you could possibly make a mistake. Not that he did, and I'm not defending him by any ways and means, sure. but... Uh, but I didn't ask, wait a minute, Slayton, what's it? Is this guy in trouble or is he a bad guy? All I knew is he said the guy's so rich and he's just a good guy. And we go over there and we have a great time. And I can't even remember the laundry list, but he must have named, you know, 10 really top comedians. And I said, get me invited. And one day he finally said, hey, Marlene, I got you invited. We're going to dinner at Jeffrey Epstein's. I'm like, fantastic. I don't know anything about the guy. I, don't, I didn't even Google him. I didn't care. And we went to two. Uh, to East 71st Street, which was his palace. Right, which that, I know, think was that, at the time the largest apartment in New York City. It, and, and it had been a girl's school. And why that has, nobody ever brought that up. It was a girl's school before it was a single residence, which I think is irony of ironies. <clears throat> so I go there and it was me and a comedian named Nick DiPaolo and Bobby Slayton and Bobby Slayton's wife and Jeffrey Epstein and Woody Allen and Soon Yee and Jay Thomas. Do you know who Jay Thomas is? He uh, used to be on Cheers. Yeah, and he was yeah. a morning disc jockey. Really funny, really talented guy. Been around forever. And he has a signature bit that if you haven't seen it, you got to Google it and look at it. Just Google Jay Thomas Lone Ranger. 
And uh, Letterman, David Letterman said it was the single best panel story he had ever heard. So for 25 years, Jay Thomas came on every Christmas and told that story again. And the people went wild. And so we're all talking and somebody said, hey, Woody, you know Jay? No, no, who's Jay? He says, uh, cause Woody kind of knew who I was. And I don't, I don't think he knew who Nick was, but he's, we're talking and he says, no, I never, I never saw Saturday Night Live and I never saw, I had never watched TV. And, oh, you know Jay? Do you know Jay's famous Lone Ranger bit? And Woody Allen had, had no idea. And Jay Thomas sitting there at dinner it was like a command performance for Woody. He did the Lone Ranger bit. And it was like, it was, it was surreal. It was just spectacular. And we're all laughing. And I don't know what I said or didn't say, but, you know, sometimes you know when you belong. And we all really belonged. It was all really funny guys. And Epstein was in his glory. And we didn't eat something crazy. You know, we just ate a really nice meal, whatever it was. And we laughed our asses off. And then as we're leaving, he goes, you know what? Uh, you really fascinate me with these jokes. I, uh, I really love jokes. You know, why don't you come back, you know, in a couple of weeks? And I'm like, sure. Another free meal. I'm a comedian. <laughs> so I came back in a couple of weeks. And once again, I, I knew nothing about the guy. And this had to be, it was, I'm pretty sure it was April, not, uh, April 2015, which I think was after Trump had come down the escalator. And he was just get I just thrown his hat in the ring. I'm not really exactly sure, but it was just where Trump was all of a sudden it looked like he was gonna be in politics. Because I remember there was a specific time in my mind where I got this chill and I said to myself, You can't tell me that Donald Trump is gonna be in the Republican debates. That just did not compute to me. I was like, no. That and, you know, there's been so many no since then, you know, like this is going to do him in. This is going to do him in. Nothing. He's bulletproof. So, so I go over to Jeffrey's and it's just me and him. And he's got some kid playing the piano because he's paying his, his, uh, his way through college to learn to be a concert pianist. So he's playing piano and me and him are having dinner. There were no young, sexy girls running around or anything weird or any weird, you know, it was like having dinner with a very wealthy guy in a huge place. And, and, I'm sure I only saw the first two rooms, you know. So we're sitting there and we're eating and laughing. And he said, you know, I really love jokes. He said, you know, tomorrow night I'm going to Harvard. Harvard loves me because I give them millions of dollars. And I'm going to go see a lecture by Noam Chomsky. And he loves me too because I give him millions of dollars. And when he's done with this lecture, I'm going to go in the dressing room and we're going to sit there and we're going to tell dirty jokes. (laughs) And I said, you know, I am not surprised. Everybody loves dirty jokes. I don't know if I told you. Uh, I get off the beaten track, but uh, that's okay. A guy came up to me at a film festival twenty years ago, and he said, "Jackie, I had a music teacher, and my music teacher's grandfather was a world famous cantor, and it was around the turn of the century, and he was good friends with Enrico Caruso." And all, you know, all the glitter eye of the country. And one of his best friends was Albert Einstein. And he said, and you know, he, he told, he told my music teacher that Albert Einstein loved dirty jokes. That's why I had to tell you this story. He said, and Albert Einstein's favorite joke was, my dick isn't that big, but I love every foot of it. (laughs) Which is. Which just is, it's smart. It's, well, Albert Einstein, do the math, the math. So, <laughs> so I, I just so funny. So I'm never, never surprised at how much really smart people love jokes. I did a show at the Friars Club one time and I had Stella and Mira, you know, Jerry Stiller from like the yeah, Seinfeld yeah. show. Sure. Who's like one of the brilliant, it just, and, and Mira, they were a couple, they were a comedy pair for decades and decades. And I did a show. Uh, among other people, but they were sitting at my feet. And I'm like, how intimidating can anything be? And they were just roaring. And when I got done, Jerry said, you know, uh, I think I met you years ago at the, uh, at the Just For Last Festival. I'll tell you those jokes, like, 
They're fantastic. He said, you know, each of your jokes is like a small one-act play, you know, with the beginning and the middle and the finish. And I'm like, I said, I got the chills, Jerry. That's the nicest compliment. I, just the fact that you guys sat through my show is enough of a compliment. You know, but people that get it, you know, it, it's the, there's a certain amount of people you can tell them the best joke in the world and they're going to say, oh, that's stupid. Well, yeah, it's stupid. It's a joke, you moron, you know. So at any rate, Jeffrey's, we have a great time. And I'm telling him a few jokes and telling him a little bit of my stories. He told me a little bit of his stories. He never said anything like, let's go get some girls or do you like women or are you married? You know, it was just about jokes and we're just having fun. And this is almost like a Columbo. Oh, one thing, Mrs. Smith, I forgot that. So we're walking out and we're at the top of the stairs about to go down and out the door. And there's that famous, now famous, big painting of Bill Clinton holding a blue dress, which is obviously very stained. And I saw that and I said, hey, I, I know you're friends with Clinton. He, I know he's been here. He, and that's there. He goes, yeah, it's, it's, it's not his favorite painting. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so I'm laughing. At, I'm, I'm like not pals with this guy, but after two dinners, you know somebody a little bit. And completely out of nowhere, I said, uh, you know, Donald Trump, you know, you're a rich guy and he's a rich guy and you're New York City guys. You must you must know Donald Trump. And he goes, yeah, you know, well, me and Donald were very close for a long time. Now, I didn't know that they used to double team 14 year olds at Jeffrey's house. And, and, you know, the whole backstory that went on and on and on. But nobody knew any of this at, at the time. Nobody knew anything about either of them unless they really looked into it. And, uh, and and we all know that with each passing day, the Google and the internet just versions like this. You know, sure. one f- you find out one fact, and five years later, you got the whole backstory of anything you want to look up. So he's talking to me. He goes, yeah, me and Donald used to be great friends, but we had a falling out. And I wasn't surprised. I said, oh, uh, what, bad business deal? I know he's beat up a lot of people in business. And this is Jeffrey Epstein talking. He said, no, it was a morals thing. I, I swear, <laughs> I, I hear this. I mean, James, I mean, I, this stuck to my, my head like, like it happened yesterday. And this is absolutely almost word for word. He says, it was a morals thing. And I said, a morals thing? He says, yeah. He said, one day, Donald just said to me, do you fuck your best friend's wives? And I told him, well, I'm not married. I've never been ma- married, but but no. You know, I mean, there's honor among thieves. I don't know what he's doing, but, you know, that's something he, I guess, where he would draw a line. You know, he said, no, of course not. And Trump said to him, that's the only way I can get off. Is I try and fuck my best friend's wives. And if I can't get to them, I have their husbands come over to my office and we sit down before or after lunch and sit there and chat. I have the phone on speakerphone and his wife on the line without him knowing. And we start talking about broads and what we like to do. And that way they can hear what low lives their husbands are. And then I can get to them. And Jeffrey said, and that, that was just it. I said, all right, game over. I'm done with this guy. I mean, that's... So wrong, so low, so subversive. It's so wrong on so many levels. And, you know, I'm sure Epstein was a bad guy, but he's not the last guy that's going to have sex with a 15-year-old girl. So I, I don't know the extent. I never heard anything about them beating girls up or tying them up. But, you know, even the, even the young girls that were, uh, they had a court case, and just before, just before they had the press conference, they had it all set up to do. At the last minute, they canceled the press conference. Now, I don't know whether the, the girls' families were threatened or whatever. Who knows? But uh, but part of the thing, if you if you Google uh, Jane Doe, Jeffrey Epstein, even to this day, you see the complaint, and the girl says, "Yeah," and then. Uh, they took advantage of me and they took advantage of me 
every time I went over there, <laughs> like, wait a minute, wait, you know, don't go back, you know, but I guess if you're a 15 year old girl and I, I don't know if he's given $200 or $500 or $5,000. So the whole thing was pretty weird, but uh, it's just like Lee Harvey Oswald, you know, you're never going to know. You know? And it, I knew he was going to die in prison the second they put him in prison. I said, he didn't got a chance. And, you know, and the list of people that probably wanted him dead was a line around the block, you know. So it was pretty sad. And and truth be told, I enjoyed the little bit of time that I spent with him. I actually did, you know. It's funny that he had a moral line, that Jeffrey Epstein had a moral line. Uh, but but that doesn't, you know, that like the honor among thieves, like, there's enough women out there, you know, to, I, I, that just, I, I don't even know anybody that's ever said, hey, guess what I did? I, you know, I banged my neighbor's wife. You know, that's not one of the things that comes up in conversation. That's that. That's not one of the options. Sure. You know, you know, I love my babysitter or, or you know, uh, my my wife's aunt or something, you know, that can be outside. But, you know. Now, at that dinner. Did Woody Allen strike you as the strangest person at that dinner? Uh, he, he was exactly what you would ex expect. He was quiet, but he was forthcoming. When anybody asked him a question, he was quiet. You know, but no, I, I never really watch TV. I'm not really aware of, of any of this. And, I, you know, uh, I don't know whether he said I don't see my movies or anything like that. But, uh, but he didn't say anything earth shattering and he didn't say anything especially funny, any funnier than anything. The one thing that was great is nobody was grandstanding and trying to be trying to be funny. I mean, this was a really group, a good group of guys and girls that were talking and if something was funny and somebody made a funny comment, but nobody was trying to be boisterous and, uh, you know, find their way into Woody's next movie. You know, it was sure. just, uh, it was just a really cordial, nice time. It was, it was, very different. And then I just sent you the picture, which I'm sure I sent before. I love showing it to people because it's Nick DiPaolo, Bobby Slayton, Woody Allen, me, and Jay Thomas. And I show it and I, and I tell people, I'll give you 50 guesses and uh, I'll buy you dinner if you can guess who took this picture. And it was Jeffrey who took the picture because he would never be in a picture, you know. So when did this documentary happen? I know it's, it hasn't been released yet. Joke Man? Yeah, it's it's available at jokemanmovie.com. That's a website that has uh, the click through to the, to the Vimeo. There's also the trailer and all spectacular reviews, which just, you know, they read, the reviews read like I wrote them. You know, they're that good, you know. Yeah, so there's they Joke Man jokemanmovie.com and we just did a sold out uh, screening at the Long Island Music and Entertainment Hall of Fame and James it it it's so flattering how interested people still are because I left that Stern show uh 23 years ago okay I've been doing I did an interview the other day with a kid who wasn't born when I left the show, you know, one of those things. Was he, was he, I forget, was he on Sirius XM when you left? No, no, I left five years before that. And so, um, oh, that's a whole funny story too. But uh, we did the sold out screening and the movie is an, an hour and 15 minutes. And after we did a Q&A and the Q&A was another hour and 20 minutes. People had questions and they were so interested in the whole the comedy thing. And, you know, my stories go on and on, but they, they're pretty interesting. You know, the devil is always in the details, you know, sure. because there's a lot of things we just touch on in the documentary and people go, Oh, I got a question. And so now I'm going to go around the country. I got another one at the Bolton center uh, in Bayshore on Long Island coming up on uh, April 5th. And I want to do, you know, all the stern markets, these people are so enamored of these shows and they love the old shows because the shows in the nineties, were by far the best ones. So I want to go to like Chicago and Las Vegas and, and Miami and Myrtle Beach and Philadelphia 
and show this, show the documentary and then do the Q and A. And I know people, you know, I'm not going to make any money doing it, but it's so much fun because I never, people are like, oh, Jackie ever stop talking about the stupid Stern show? I'm like, did Groucho ever stop talking about the Marx Brothers? Jesus Christ, what are you, stupid? No, and, and you, you know. were there, I mean, arguably, and I'm not a historian of Stern, but arguably his peak was around 1996 or so when Private Parts came out. I would say that was his peak. Absolutely. And is the, the story about that, it is mind mind shattering, and uh, the Why? stories about everything. I was, I mean, they, the you know, when people hear the stuff that actually ha happened behind the scenes, they're like, "Well, no wonder you." And I didn't leave. I just asked for a lot more money. That's all I did. You know, if you have a job, you don't have to quit. You could say to the boss, "I want to make this much," and you never get what you're worth. You get what you negotiate. And that happened two or th you know three or four times before that, where I walked out because they wouldn't pay me, and they gave me the money I wanted, and I came back. That happened a bunch of times, and this time they just didn't didn't want to meet my demands. But um, I was worth I was absolutely worth it, and I had so much to do with with his climb. And there's people that will argue about that. You know, I get emails. Oh, the Stone Show got so much better when you left, and they're like they're idiots. You know, they. They really don't know. And people love the old shows and they love to ask questions about it. And, you know, I was there. I was part of the 1927 Yankees. You know, I can tell the tales of the locker room. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, it was a, it was a great time. It was, I mean, the last time I listened to the show was probably 2000 or no, 1999 or 2000 around then. I remember, I remember specifically Howard had just separated from his wife and uh, Shmuley Botiak was on trying to counsel him and Howard was just like, shut up. You know, you don't know what you're talking about. Get off the show. So <laughs> that was like literally the last time I, I watched the show. I think it was, uh, I think it was 1998 or nine. You know, um, nobody, none of us had any inkling what was going on with Howard and his wife. Okay. And in retrospect, there was one clue that, nobody picked up on and there's no way we would have picked up on but at some point towards the end of the 90s gary came in during a commercial break and said you know they said that one out of every five people one out of every five couples ends up in a divorce who do you think's going to get divorced out of us me or john or fred or you or jackie who howard and howard said i know who's going to be the first one that's divorced you know, and he just said that and it didn't really register. I thought maybe he had some inside information about Fred or Gary or something, but he knew damn well he was on his way to divorce. I didn't know that. So I was working in Atlantic City and this was at the height of our fame. And, you know, I was down there for a film festival. and I was literally wearing sunglasses and a, and a baseball hat because I didn't want to be recognized because people just, you know, they don't care about me, but they want to ask questions about Howard or whatever. And I'm sitting there, and this is a Friday afternoon or Friday night. And all of a sudden, behind the bar on the TV, it says, Stern and wife separate. And I, you could have knocked me over with a feather. And meanwhile, they released the news on a Friday. So maybe the news would calm down a hair by Monday. And when, when we went in Monday, I had this note up, framed on my wall because it's so funny. I wrote a note and put it up. And a lot of times when I wrote something really funny and like if we did a, a press conference in, you know, Toronto or Boston or something and I give them stuff to say, a lot of times they'd lead off the articles with something funny that he said, which was usually something I wrote, which I love seeing in print. But, uh, and is this wound up being the first thing in, in a lot of articles, we on Monday after the whole world knew that he had separated from Allison, or, or announced it on Friday, we sat down and uh, and the microphones. He turned the microphones on, and the first note I wrote, he said, "All broads, please call." <laughs> <laughs> did, did he say it? But, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. And and that and that was like the opening line of a lot of the. A lot of the articles, you know, because it caught every caught everybody off off kilter, you know. Uh.
but uh, and those were, you know, those were great days. And she was, and she was sweet. She was, you know, she was a pal, you know, and uh, the, the, it was, it was just the whole thing was a great ride. It really was. So no complaints, you know. And now, joke man, is there going to be an official release? Are you going to put it on Amazon or? You know, it took a long time. The producers, IKA Collective, uh, Ian Carr, and he was the director and the producer, and Ronnie Thomas was the editor who works with Ian, and Ian's had IKA Collective for like 30 years, and it's a production company in New York. And it's funny, we met at the Friars Club like a year or two before I left the show, and he was a new friar. And we're hanging out, he was such a huge Stern fan. And five minutes after we started talking, he said, Jesus, man, he said, you're not the guy on that show. You can't be that guy because I was funny and articulate and a nice guy. And meanwhile, he had he had me pegged as this angry little fat dwarf that didn't have a brain in his head, you know. So me and Ian became fast friends. And then years later, after Howard went to Sirius, I had my own show on Sirius called Jackie's Joke Hunt. That was me and Ian for eight years. We did 400 shows of solid, dirty jokes, which were just they're just classic, classic joke shows. And then he said, you know, I'd really like to do a, a documentary on you. And I couldn't have been more flattered, but he just did it. You know, I gave him all the pictures he needed. I told him who I thought would be a good interview. And I gave him whatever input, but I had no control over it. But it took a lot of time. And then when he's get, just coming to the to a head, the pandemic hit, which just yanked the rug out of everybody for so long. I'm sure you were, well, I don't know how much it affected you, but like, it was crazy. I was about to join the Friars Club uh, that week. And then everything shut down. I figured, ah, forget it. Oh, Jesus. And, and that's long gone, but that's a whole nother story. But, uh, but then finally pulled it together and the thing was so great. And we waited for so long because we thought Netflix was going to take it and put it on for free that we would not get paid. But to have it on Netflix is worth its weight in gold. Sure. But this is right, of course, knowing my, my good news, bad news career. This is right when Netflix had that whole falling out and the whole stock went kaflooey and blah, blah, blah. And then he gave up on that and we finally got a distributor and we were on iTunes and Amazon. And within four days, we were the number four documentary on iTunes. We were above Yogi Berra's documentary. I was like, I just couldn't believe it. And people were loving it. And then it turned out that the distributors, random media, went haywire. You know, I, I guess they were crooks. And I don't mind saying that. And they went declared bankruptcy and Ian never got any of the money. And we finally got the rights back. So now it's up on Vimeo. So you can't buy it. You can only rent it, for three, but it's $3.99, which is chump change. You know, so you can, you can upload it yourself to Amazon. Like Amazon will, let, and then nobody could tell if it's Amazon Prime or if it was uploaded by someone. Like you could put it back on Amazon. I, I, I'm the guy that tells the jokes. <laughs> The, you know, the, Ian and Ron, they know what they're doing. And I just follow their lead and whatever we got to do. And, uh, you know, I do screenings. You know, I got like a, a bunch of really funny cartoons that are just cartoons of my jokes that we play before. So that's like, like on the movies as a kid, you know, there's a couple of cartoons sure. and then the movie, you know. Yeah. And it's, uh, and it's really great. And now that we have the, you know, we just, the, the first screening was like a, maybe a month ago. And uh, I mean, we did a family and friends screening in Manhattan and on Long Island, <clears throat> but that's your family and your friends. Oh, it's so great. It's so great. It's really great when people you don't know tell you it's great, you know, and people say, oh, ah, you know what? I was never a Stern fan, but boy, I really enjoyed the documentary. You know, that's the kind of thing. Cause it's, it's, you know, it, it, it's, it's a fun thing. It's a, it's a guy getting lucky. But well, making his well, own luck, you know. Well, what I, mean? I, I, I don't, I don't like the word lucky so much. I mean, when particularly, and I look, I love the documentary because <laughs> it is such a documentary of success. And of course, success. People say you create your own luck. I don't know if that's totally true either, but you certainly create the potential for luck 
by doing all the things you did. And when you create enormous potential for luck, luck happens. I, and, you know, people, you know, of course, people say very often, people go, yeah, but where would you be if you hadn't met Howard Stern? And you know what I say to him? I say, where would he be if he hadn't met me? Because the fact he was an outrageous guy, but being funny made him so much more palatable. You know, you could be, you could be say anything you want. If you end it with a punchline or something funny and then go to commercial, it really pick, picks the balloon, lets the air out. You know, there's a famous story <clears throat> where somebody is talking to Hel Hillary Clinton. And they said, yeah, you know, you're, you're hot stuff and Secretary of State, blah, blah, blah. But you're married to Bill Clinton. What if you were married to a gas station attendant? And you know what she said? She said, then he'd be president. <laughs> <laughs> right. Which is beautiful. You know, it's yeah. like, you know, it's, it's give and take. It really is. It's push-pull. I wouldn't have been there all those years if I wasn't worth my weight in salt. You know, nobody in show business is doing anybody a favor. They love keeping everybody there who's there because, but it's because it works. You know, they, I wouldn't have, somewhere in the early nineties, I said, I said, Howard, you know, me and you and Robin and Fred were the Beatles of radio and man, did they have me. They broke my balls and gave me such a hard time. And that, that wound up sticking, and we've been the Beatles of radio ever since then. But Howard hates that because he doesn't see us as the Beatles of radio. You know, he's he's Wayne Newton, and we're the backup singers. That's how he sees it. You know, which is which is not true. You know, right? So, well, Jackie, Joke Man was excellent. I watched it right before we did this interview. I really enjoyed it. And I learned, even though we've, we've talked quite a bit and we've been on the podcast a bunch of times, I learned a lot about you and it was funny. It was a lesson in success. It was a history lesson because you've been around the block and met so many people like over these decades, it was just a history of these times. I love the fact that even during this talk here, you keep referring to DJs as disc jockeys. No one even knows what a disc or a jockey is. <laughs> No I know DJ. that. I know that. I tell people my first records were, you know, LPs. You know, like, you know, they I got one right. That's one of my records <laughs> right there. You know, um, it, 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 yeah, you know, you, you see th so many things come and go. I mean, I could bore you forever. When my, back in college, I used to send away to these uh, things where you get 99 cents, you get 10 records, or you get, right, like the Columbia books. Record House or something. Right, right. Columbia Record Club. And at one point, they started giving you a tape player with, with, your, with your choices. And the first tape player I got from Columbia Record Club was a four track. And people for years told me I was out of my mind, that I was full of a crap. And then like a year later, they came out with this newer gadget called an eight track. And for years, people told me I was crazy. But now with Google, you just Google four track, you know, player, and there it is in Google, and it's a, and it rubber stamps what I was doing at the time. And it was funny because the four track tapes I got, I got the exact same tapes for the eight track player, and they were all Columbia artists, you know, like Simon Garfunkel, Bookends, and Jimi Hendrix, and Blood, Sweat, and Tears, whatever they were, and it, it was just, you know, it was so exciting to have a tape player in the car as opposed to that little. AM speaker, all of a sudden you got stereo, boom. Yeah, it was like a, a new world. But that's yeah. so long ago. You know, so and it was so just, cheap to get all these songs. But now, of course, you get infinite songs for free. It's, it, you know, that whole thing is, I don't know how that's all going to shake down. It's crazy. People are back to having to make money going around. You know, people used to go around to perform, to sell records. And now they have to sell records to get people to their shows. I mean, it's, it's always going to be a hustle, you know, always going to be a hustle. And I still love going out and doing my stupid shows and telling my jokes. So, you know, it's a no, no lose proposition. You know, sometimes I make a lot of money. Sometimes I don't make so much money, but I think one thing I want to tell your listeners, if, uh, if anybody's interested, I answer every email I've ever gotten. And I have lots of proof of that, but, uh, my email is jokeland at AOL.com, J-O-K-E-L-A-N-D 
at AOL.com. I answer every question. I write back to everybody. Uh, you wouldn't even begin to believe the, the people that I've connected with. Like me and Willie Nelson have been exchanging dirty jokes for 25 years. 25 years we've been sending dirty jokes back and forth. Yeah, and you just guys are telling dirty jokes together in the movie. Right. It just, it's, uh, I said, Willie, we've been doing so long. We got to tell some jokes in, in, my, in my documentary. And he said, well, sure, you know. And that, that alone is a whole story. You know, we went down to House of Blues and got in the bus and, and uh, <laughs> we did the interview. When we were done with the interview, he, he, he lit up a joint and he passed it to me. And Ian, my partner, he's a nice Jewish boy from Chappaqua. He's not a big pothead. And he's got a, he was the one shooting the video. So he takes a big hit and then he starts having a coughing fit. So me and Willie smoked more while we're waiting for him to get done coughing. And then Willie had to go in and do his show. He would smoke. He'd get so stoned and then go in and do his 75-minute show at 85 uh, years old. Oh, my gosh. So we leave the bus and go to go in. And we couldn't get into the show because Ian had his camera with him. You can't take a camera into a rock and roll show. So this poor stoned man had to try and find our hotel in whatever section of New Orleans we're in. So I went in and like an hour later, he showed that he was out of his mind. And I thought it was, just, I said, how, what, how great is that? That Willie Nelson got you so stoned you couldn't find your way around New Orleans. You know, that's a, that's a story for the age. And, and, and Willie at 85 the, has no problem. No, no. I was sitting there and uh, just having a great old time. Just a great old time. Yeah, he's good. So Joe Listen, Planet I, I TV. Will talk, at, I will talk to you anytime, anywhere. And I know that you had your comedy clubs. Yeah. And I want us to open, I want us to open a jokes comedy club. I really think there's room for it. I think people want to laugh. And I think it could be a home run. And I will supply the jokes. Just get I, us a place and I promise we'll pack. I agree with you because one time I was actually opening up for TJ Miller, who's stand-up comedian and he was totally bombing uh nothing was working and so what he did was he literally took out a book of jewish jokes and started telling the jokes and then people were laughing like everybody was laughing at everything he's, he's a good performer he just needed the material that worked i uh, you know you're preaching you are preaching to the choir my friend now i will leave you with my joke that i've been telling everybody a guy buys a farm, so he has to get a cow. So he goes to a place where they're selling cows. He sees a nice cow, and he turns to the guy selling the cow. He says, I think this is a nice cow. I think I want to buy it. But I got to make sure it's still vital. And the guy selling the cow says, well, whatever you got to do. So the guy reaches under and pulls on one of the cow's nipples. And the cow cuts a huge fart. So the guy pulls on another nipple, and the cow cuts an even bigger fart. And he turns to the guy selling the cow. And he says, this cow's from Minnesota, isn't it? And the guy selling the cow says, yeah, how could you tell? He says, my wife is from Minnesota. <laughs> I see, how could, there's no way you can not laugh at that. You know, the wives laugh at that. You know, so harmless, right? <laughs> it, it is. And you know what? You, you go back through history and you see this in, in all the stuff you sent me and all the stuff you told me. This is um, history. This is the, the you know, Shakes people went to Shakespeare's plays for the dirty jokes. A absolutely. People have been laughing, you know. People have been ever since the caveman was standing there and a rock fell on his head and his wife laughed. And it's been a free-for-all ever since then. I think some you of know, the first the, cave drawings, they said, were dirty jokes, actually. I'm And supposedly, they they tried this about us, but supposedly the first thing that... Uh, Edison recorded was a dirty joke. You know, oh, really? Now they have it. Oh, Mary was had a little lamb. That's bullshit. You know, like <laughs> big. But who cares? It's just it's just fun. So we can talk about anything. I, you know, I'm gonna start uh, sending you a dirty joke here and there. I didn't, you know, when he told me that he heard you talking about me, I asked a few people. I I was trying to find Steve Cohen, and you know, in. <laughs> In New York, if you throw a frisbee, you hit ten Steve Cohens. I know. You know there's so too many. There's too many Steve Cohens. So I'm looking, and then I said, you know what? I'll just try your email, and you had the same email. So and people say, oh, Jackie, I tried your email. It's the same. I said, well, 
Mine's been the same for 25 years, too. Jokeland at AOL.com. Write to me and tell me that uh, your goal in life is to steal James's haircut. <laughs> no, unfortunately, nobody wants that. But uh, hey, hey, why, why Atlanta? You know, there's no real reason. I think I was basically kicked out of New York, and I, 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 I do miss it. Like I always, I, I've born in New York. No, wait, there wait, whoa, whoa, whoa! What do you mean kicked out of New York? By whom? Well, you know, I wrote. I my listeners have heard all this, but I wrote this article in 2020 because I was worried about New York. I thought there was going to be a lot of problems due to this pandemic and that New York wasn't addressing it, you know, commercial real estate and remote work and the crime and sanitation and all these things. New York needs a hundred billion a year to open up the doors and they weren't going to get it because everyone was leaving. New York state still is the state with the largest decline since the pandemic. And I wrote this article about it and everyone, literally everyone hated me. Seinfeld actually wrote a full page op-ed in the times trashing me, Andrew Cuomo, de Blasio, all these people like trashed me. So I, I left for a while to Florida and then, uh, but you, were, you weren't talking crash, you, trash. You were making an assessment of what you believed, right? Yeah. And you I was using try, facts you weren't to trying to up. shut down New York city. You were just right. saying from where I'm sitting, this is what I think. Yeah. I was worried. And I didn't see the solution. And so I think that was the problem is I didn't solve the problem in the article. I, and, and look, I, I know Eric Adams and, and we talked about my article afterwards, like people who are serious respected my article, but, uh, uh, yeah, just, it became an unplugged. Jay was harassed. The comedy club was vandalized. Uh, it's just, a, really? It was, yeah. Jay. So how long do you think it's going to take you to fuck up Atlanta? <laughs> <laughs> well, Atlanta's probably dead forever, too. Who knows? I'll have to hey, write that article. Come back to New York. Come back I'm there to occasionally. New York. Well, we'll hang out next time I'm there. I'm, I'm there. Remember the old the old joke? It's been 45 years since uh, El Fufo uh, farted in the marketplace. You remember that story? No, that was, no. that was, there was some guy that cut such a loud in the 1200s. He was in the <laughs> marketplace in Arabia or something. And he cut such a loud fart that he was so embarrassed that he had to leave town. And it was 40 years later. And uh, his wife says, you know, I think it's probably okay for us to go back to town. So 40 years later, he comes back into town and he says to somebody, what day is it? And they said, oh, oh it's February 12th. Exactly 39 years and 14 days since you've wandered in the marketplace. <laughs> I people, think, people I think that is the best analogy of what happened to me I've ever heard. Because even <laughs> yesterday on Twitter, Someone trashed me for that article. So it's like people, it's like four years later, people are obsessed with it. But, uh, hey, yeah. hey, I, if I, if they, people are still up my ass about the money I owe Rodney Dangerfield, which I don't owe him and never did. You know, Howard would carve something in stone. And these people, un, it, unbelievable. And I explained the whole story in my, in my autobiography. The, you know, my autobiography was The Joke Man. Bow to Stern. Did I, I'm sure I sent you that. Did I send you oh, that? I've, uh, we've done a podcast about it. And, uh, and, but people, they don't, nobody wants to know, you know, that they, every, a lot of people don't write me. They don't hate me. They just, they're being Howard. Uh, you know, I got to say something crappy to Jackie because that's what Howard would want me to do, which is kind of, you know, the fact that they care enough to go to that much sure. trouble, you know, let them have a party, you know. I guess I got to let people have more parties. I know. I know I go on and on. I don't mean to be so long-winded, but thank you so much for having me on. No, and Jackie, hello, always a pleasure. Hello to Peter Holm, my dear friend. This guy is about uh, he's even shorter than me, and he had this amazing build. He was built like a V and then had no legs. So oh we used gosh. to call him, the, we called him the mighty half. And I hadn't talked to him in 40 years and I dialed the phone and he answered and I go, mighty half. He's like, how do you remember that? <laughs> the hell That's Such so a funny great guy. that he heard me talking about you, but I appreciate it. Thanks to him. And, uh, and Jackie, congrats once again on, on everything, but this, this documentary joke, man, and knock yourself out. And, and Jackie, when I'm in New York, we'll hang out. I would please do not hesitate to let me know when you're coming. And I owe you dinner. And we'll have, we can't go to the Friars Club, you know, but we'll go to Gallagher's, we'll go to the Palm, we'll go to someplace fun. Can't even you go know, to Carnegie Deli either. That, 
I, you know, I just walked, we went to a screen, uh, not a screen, went to see Broadway Laundry the other night, which is the new uh, John uh, Patrick Shandling play. And the guy just is amazing. And, um, and you know, just walking past where the Carnegie Deli was, just, it, you know, I almost cry. You know, I had yeah. six eight by tens in there, like from almost, from each decade of my life. You can watch me age as you walk on your way to the bathroom. But, uh, you know, this guy, he he wrote the play Doubt, and he wrote this Brooklyn Laundry, but he wrote Moon uh, Moonstruck, which is oh, kind yeah. of like, the guy that wrote Doubt wrote Moonstruck. Cher so and, I just, uh, Bruce I, Willis. I, was and it Bruce I, Willis? No, no, it was uh, Cher. Uh, it was uh, Nick, uh, Nicolas Cage and, uh, no. It was Cher? Cher and Nicolas Cage, I think. I've seen it a hundred times and it was just, it was just so, so great. And, um, when I found out that he wrote, that he wrote that and we met him the other night, cause this is, this is a, a warm up to the release of the, uh, you know, it's a pre-screening or, or not a screening, but a pre-show at uh, a theater club. And my friends that I was with are good friends with him. And I, and I wrote to her, uh, Isla Mel and I said, listen, um, I know you're good friends with him. I really would like him to hear this story because the guy's from the Bronx. And I had a friend that, before he died, worked with Yogi Berra on Yogi's videos for the Hall of Fame and for his website. And the course of working with Yogi Berra, Yogi said a couple things that were very typical Yogi things, but they weren't things that are in the mainstream of that you're always reading. Do you know who I'm talking about? The whole yeah, yeah, sure. thing and yeah. all the crazy things he said. But these were things he said while they were working together. And I said, I just really want him to hear it. Now, John Patrick Shandling, he's a playwright. He's an Irish guy. He could be a voracious baseball fan, but he might not even know what baseball is. But he's from the Bronx. So I said, so I got to take a shot that you're a Yankee fan. And my friend was worth working with Yogi. And one of the things Yogi said was, you know, Cher, she was really good in that movie Moonstruck. I think she got the golden glove to that. <laughs> Which is just a terrific Yogi. So, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shut up. I want to see you in New York. I would love to. I would really yeah, love Jackie, to see you. Thanks so much once again. Great stuff. And, and. I, this movie was great. I highly recommend people see it. So, jokemanmovie.com. Guys, I will see you later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. We call it the cliff. Once your child leaves high school and most kids like mine get a certificate of completion, not even a GED. And that's when you usually rely on your local business people to have a heart to employ your kid. Bagging groceries, folding clothes. Clemson Life is a program where you are taught independent living, how to cook, personal hygiene, how to handle money, how to take public transportation. Stop punishing yourself with bland, chalky protein shakes and fuel your fitness with the best protein in the game at GNC. We've got the hottest brands and flavors that legit taste like cookies, your favorite cereal, indulgent desserts, and more. It's on at GNC.